Hey, uh, last time we were talking about the heretical movements, those challenges to uh, the growing, very rapidly growing Catholic Church in Europe, uh, and now we're going to deal with you know, the church's uh, organized reply to that. Um, so, uh, for the most part, those heretical movements and heretical individuals themselves, if the church gets a hold of them before the public does, uh, like we saw with Peter of Bruy, but if the church uh, gets a hold of these people, they, they typically deal with them through inquisitions. Uh, and these are early inquisitions. This is not uh, what we see with the, the Span, so-called Spanish Inquisition. That's in the, in the 1400s with Ferdinand and Isabella. Uh, that's much, much later than we're talking about now. Uh, but these early inquisitions, uh, there's two different kinds of these. Uh, there's the Episcopal Inquisition and the Papal Inquisition. Uh, the first sort of incarnation of these are the Episcopal Inquisitions, and these are created through uh, what's called a papal bull. This is just a, basically an, an order, a decree from the Pope. And these are started in 1184. Uh, and they're called Episcopal Inquisitions, not because they have anything to do with the Episcopal Church. It's because Latin, uh, the Latin word for bishop is episcopus. So you have the Episcopal uh, Inquisitions. Uh, this uh, papal bull charged local bishops to investigate members of their congregation and to question them about their beliefs. And uh, if they were to find a heretic within their, their congregation, uh, they're supposed to try to convict, convince them of the errors of their ways. Uh, a lot of times we, we kind of sort of imagine the, uh, the Inquisitions to be just this sort of effort to uh, root out these people and kill them. That's not at all the point. Uh, the point is to convince them to stop being heretics and to come back to the Catholic Church. If we do that, we've succeeded. If we have to kill these people, we have failed. And so the, the entire focus of all of these inquisitions is to get these people to renounce. We don't want them to be killed. That's the last resort. That's if we cannot possibly get them to rejoin the church. Uh, the, the whole point is to get them to to come back. Uh, unfortunately, uh, this first incarnation doesn't last very long because it's ineffective. Uh, the bishops of these local congregations aren't really good at doing this. Um, one, they have a tremendous amount of duties. Uh, to attend to, and, and you're you're stacking something else on top. You're asking them to question in depth every member of the congregation and root out what these people might believe. And they're, you know, the congregation, if they are a heretic, they're trying to hide this. They don't want to let the bishop know, and and so it, it doesn't really really work. It's it's difficult. You're you're tasking them with an additional thing. Another thing that is a failure, I guess, uh, for, it, is, it definitely is a failure uh, in some ways, um, for the Episcopal Inquisitions is that during the interviews, during the investigations, the bishop would name the accuser. And so if you were accused of heresy, uh, you know, remember, if you don't renounce your beliefs, if you don't fold back into the church, your life is on the line. And so a lot of times uh, when the bishop would reveal who has accused you of heresy, that person wound up dead. And you can't have a trial without the star witness to accuse you. And so people that accused others of heresy during the Episcopal uh Inquisition, they wound up dead a lot. And so that was, it's going to sound funny, but that was a weakness of the Episcopal Inquisitions. So a, a lot later, in the 1230s, uh, eventually we will arrive at what's called the Papal Inquisition. Uh, the Pope doesn't do this him, himself as far as, you know, in, investigating people, but 
here's the change. There's a couple of changes. A big change is that these are professional inquisitors. These are inquisitors will travel from town to town and investigate people. That's their only job. That's their only responsibility. So they have more time to be able to deal with this stuff. Uh, the second thing that is really, really a big change is that we're not telling you who your accusers are. And so that opportunity to murder your accuser so that uh, you cannot be uh, charged, that's, that's gone. Uh, so um, so a, uh, what we typically do, what we see in these inquisitions is, you know, the, the accused is going to be arrested and they will be interviewed at length and a big thing. There's no guarantee of a speedy trial. We have that in the U.S. They don't have that at this time. And so these people might be held for months or sometimes even years and before it even goes to trial. Uh, and every so often, maybe a month, maybe two months, maybe next year, uh, the Inquisitor will revisit you in jail to interview you. And uh, what's a scary thing? They never tell you what you're being accused of. You are just being accused of heresy. Why don't you tell me what kind of heretical thoughts or actions that you've committed? And so, uh, in an effort to try to get a little bit of leniency out of these guys, people admit to whatever. And you know, and at the end of the interview, the inquisitor will just simply say, "Well, thank you for your time, and I'll, I'll visit you again someday." And you never know when they're going to come back, and you don't know if you've just admitted to what they wanted or if it was something else. And so these people are left locked up, uh, just turning this over in their heads, wondering, you know, what what possible thing did I ever do that was considered heresy, and I will make sure to admit that next time, hoping for some leniency. Um, in a, a very sort of a strange uh, thing is the uh, positive on this is the inquisitors were incredible record keepers. They, while they are in, in, in interviewing these people and interrogating them, uh, a scribe is always in the room. And that scribe is writing down furiously everything that's going on. And those records are incredibly precious to historians because they're one of the few, few, few times that we hear about common folks from the Middle Ages. Most common folks weren't literate and they weren't recording uh, what the, you know at all what, what their daily lives were like or what they thought about things or anything. Uh, and so we, we thankfully, those records are preserved. The church did a fantastic job of recording all these interrogations and uh, they did a fantastic job of pre preserving them. So uh, it, it's a great thing that we can hear what these medieval peasants and townspeople have to say. Um, on top of that, another really cool thing is that the inquisitors were also very, very good at writing books on how to do their jobs. They want to record what works, what doesn't work, what they tried, and these are instructions to future inquisitors. And so in addition to learning about these, the, you know, these masses of people's lives and what they thought about things, we also get to learn detailed accounts of what goes on in an inquisition, in a, in a specific interview. And so that's why we know that, you know, these guys would come back in a couple of months or a year or something like that and, and be very kind of ambiguous and, you know, thank you for what you've told me. Uh, so, uh, now, when this does uh, go to trial, uh, and just a second, uh, sorry about that. Um, anyway, uh, so uh, these people are, you know, held indefinitely and put on trial and questioned for sometimes years. Uh, on a good note. Uh, during the initial questioning, uh, the inquisitors would ask, if you were accused, they would ask you for the name of anybody in the community 
that would hold a severe or moral hatred, or mortal, sorry, mortal hatred, hatred toward you. Uh, anybody that, that would hold enough of a grudge that they would want you dead. And you'd write down everybody that absolutely hates me. And it actually pays off to be very unpopular during this time period. Uh, and if your accuser was listed on that list of people that hated you enough to want you dead, then you were free to go. Uh, that you know you were released because that person's testimony is suspect and they have some other uh, safeguards in place to try uh, somewhat to uh, to keep people from you know using this to settle scores um, at, there were trials and during the trial you might be find in fact be found innocent uh, they also might find you that you're not guilty because we don't have enough evidence to convict you. You may be tried again in the future, though, uh, upon further investigation. Uh, but uh, for the guilty, after the trials, the Inquisitor would call the community get together. Everybody in the community has to attend. You don't want to bring attention to yourself by not going. And they would hold a general sermon and all of the guilty verdicts are going to be read during that sermon. So we're publicly revealing everybody that's guilty. And as they go through the, uh, the guilty findings, the verdicts, they would be very specific about what infraction each person had, had committed. And the idea there is to warn listeners away from these behaviors. Um, we don't want people to follow you, and so we're using this sort of as a teaching moment uh, now, as far as punishments, if the person had confessed and it was their first con their first offense, uh, they, they might have to perform a penance, uh, usually go on a long pil pilgrimage, uh, do something to regain entry into the church. Uh, you also may or may not have to wear a yellow cross on your clothing for the rest of your life to show uh, all of your friends and neighbors and everybody in the community that you had once been a heretic. Um, you know, some people uh, at this time, this is remarkable, some people get lifelong imprisonment. And this is interesting because inquisitors actually pioneered that idea of long-term imprisonment. Uh, secular courts uh, for criminals, they want to either find the guilty uh, and that brings in money, so that's a good thing. Or they want executions. Uh, those are quick, and we don't have the expense of housing convicts. Um, I, know, I know that that sounds terrible, but you know that's that's the way they looked at it because it is you know it's expensive and demanding of a lot of resources for long-term incarceration. Uh, now, those people that had. Uh, refused to confess or had lapsed into, se into heresy a second time, those people were handed over to secular authorities, just the civilian authorities, and they were typically burned at the stake. Uh, a big thing to note, the inquisitors are not allowed to kill you. They're not allowed to torture you in a way that deforms the body. So they can't uh, you know, cut off your arms and legs and stuff like that. Uh, you have to, at least on the outside, look uh, the same way that you did when you went into the into the uh, the Inquisitor. Now they can stretch you and pull your arms out of joint and stuff like that, and and do some terrible stuff. But they're not allowed to draw blood. They're not allowed to remove portions of your body and things like that. I, it's kind of a funny line. Uh, but again they turned you over to the secular authorities and they burned you at the stake so technically uh, the inquisition actually did not kill people uh, they, they tried you they found you guilty and they had the state kill you um, and as disturbing as it is for you know freedom of thought freedom of religion which didn't exist at this time but the Inquisitors are incredibly successful in stamping out heresy at this time. Uh, several movements, uh, Catharism, Waldenism, uh, that, are, that are pretty interesting, and I, I encourage you to go look them up if you want. 
Uh, these were popular around the 1200s. By the 1300s, Waldensianism had been driven underground. And Catharism had been driven out of southern France, Italy, and Spain. And so Catharism was really almost gone. Uh, so these, these, these are both really, really popular movements, and they're squashed uh, by the Inquisition. And they're, they're unfortunately very, very adept at what they were tasked with, which was stamping out heresy and stamping out challenges to the Catholic Church. Uh, so we will uh, get up some, uh, some more videos pretty soon. So thanks.